Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to a special program of the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California, co-presented tonight with the Climate Reality Project Bay Area Chapter. I'm John Zipperer, the club's vice president of media and editorial. We hope you're staying safe and are well wherever you are. We are busy preparing for our return to in-person programming, so keep an eye out for our reopening news. We look forward to seeing you again in person when it is safe at the Commonwealth Club's headquarters in San Francisco. In the meantime, we're continuing to do all of our programming online. This is the latest in more than 500 online programs the club has produced since the beginning of the pandemic. You can find all of our upcoming programs, as well as podcasts and video from our past events at commonwealthclub.org. For those of you joining us for the first time, the Commonwealth Club is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to the civil discussion of important issues of the day. Any opinions expressed here are those of the speakers and not of the Commonwealth Club. Now, if you're watching us live on YouTube, use the chat box to submit questions for our special guests today. We'd like to thank Claudine Cheng and the Climate Reality Project Bay Area for make, helping to make this program possible. And now to get us started, let me give you Alma Sungi Beck, Climate Justice Co-Chair of the Climate Project, excuse me, the Climate Reality Project Bay Area Chapter. Alma? Thank you, John. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you for your interest and collaboration in the climate justice work of the Climate Reality Project Bay Area Chapter. My name is Alma Sungi Beck, and I've been serving as Climate Justice Co-Chair for our chapter. Um, and we're pleased to have you all join us today for their first program in our 2021 Indigenous Voices Speaker Series. The mission of the Climate Reality Project is to catalyze a global solution to the climate crisis by making urgent action a necessity across every sector of society. To meet this mission, the Climate Reality Project is committed to showing up and standing with all people who experience social injustice and racism of any kind. As an organization fighting for climate justice, we have a responsibility to speak out against systemic racism and against systems of racial superiority, whether aware or unaware, that perpetuate violence and harm against BIPOC people and communities. BIPOC stands for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. The United States is the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases over history, and in 2016 emitted 18% of the world's greenhouse gases with only 4% of the world's population. We have a history of taking advantage of other communities here and across the world, and in this case, it's threatening the survival of humanity. Much of the reason for this can be traced back to our history as a nation and the ways that we and our ancestors have allowed ourselves to sacrifice the lives of other humans and entire communities for profit or land or the promise of wealth and prosperity. In order to be able to solve the climate crisis and move forward to a truly sustainable, regenerative economy where all humans can thrive, we have to be able to look at that history. In order to heal from the challenges of the past, we have to be willing to look at the past, think about what's happened, and think about how to move forward together with our humanity intact so that we can heal all of us and bring a truly sustainable human community moving forward. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce my friend and the moderator for today's program, Sarah Diffendorf. Sarah is the director of the Environmental Finance Center West at Earth Island Institute. In her role, Sarah has worked with Native American tribes throughout California and the American Southwest for over 15 years to help build their climate resilience. We are also lucky to have Sarah as a member of our climate justice team at the Climate Reality Project Bay Area Chapter. Our chapter is entirely made up of volunteers, which also means that we welcome all of you who live in the San Francisco Bay Area to join our chapter and to consider joining our climate justice team. As a friendly reminder, right after this program from 7.30 to 8, 
Pacific time. Our climate justice team, which includes me and Sarah and others, is hosting a 30 minute after party on Zoom to give folks a chance to connect with other participants and with the chapter's climate justice team. We realize this is an online presentation, and so we are attempting to replicate at least some of the contact and connection that people get when they attend live programs. We will be doing breakout sessions and give people a chance to think about and discuss some of what we will be learning today from our speakers, Jim Warren and Jill Sherman Warren. So without further ado, Sarah Diffendorf. Yeah. Thank you, Alma, and good evening, everyone. Um, as Alma said, this is the first installment of the Climate Reality Indigenous Voices program, which originated within the Climate Justice Committee. In short, there was quite a bit of interest within the Bay Area chapter members on engaging local tribes, and that interest was brought to the Climate Justice Committee. After many months of discussion and planning, we agreed that in order to engage with tribes, it was important for our members to, quote unquote, do the work. And that meant understanding the very long and painful history of U.S. and tribal relations, or as our first speaker in this series of speakers, Jim Warren, would call it, Indian 101. So with that, I welcome both Jim Warren and Jill Sherman Warren this evening. Jim is a member of the Oglala Lakota Sioux Nation. He is a youth and adult educator, filmmaker, and motivational speaker. He is also president of his own consulting firm, Warrior Society Development, for which he produced Seventh Generation, an award-winning documentary film, which is available on Amazon, and it's highly recommended, and all you have to do is type in Jim Warren, and you will find it and watch it. Um, Jill, who also happens to be Jim's wife, is the director of the Native American Environmental Protection Coalition, a tribally driven organization that is dedicated to providing technical assistance and environmental education and training. Jill also serves on the board of the San Diego American Indian Health Center and is a member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe in Northern California. And so with that, Jim and Jill, welcome this evening. Please join us and we're going to lead off with Jim. It's all yours. Wonderful. Uh, before Jill leaves, I just wanted her to introduce herself and uh, say something from a Hoopa perspective before we get started. So if you wouldn't mind, Jill. Hey, I'm a Tsuayakwe, Jill Sherman Warren, a Tinakwe, Natanuk. I am from the Hoopa Valley where all the trails return. And I think some of you may have heard, known, um, if you've worked with tribes, that we all think we're the only tribe there is. <laughs> so um, coming from that perspective, Hoopa, our people believe that all of the trails that go out all return back to the Hoopa Valley because we, um, as a people, have been fortunate that we have been able to maintain most of our Aboriginal territory. And that's important to us because our creator created us in the valley in which we live. So I can trace my roots back to the beginning of time, um, to the beginning of when we were formed as humans. And I think um, if all of us go back to our ancestors, we will find similar stories and similar strengths from those, from those stories that we are told as we grow up. Thank you so much, Jill. And uh, we'll go ahead and let our uh, IT person start the introduction video, please. The Washington Redskins. These days, it sounds shocking when you hear someone say that, doesn't it? Well, the Washington football team had that name before they were the Washington football team. It dates back to the early 1930s when they were the Boston Redskins. After decades of complaints and in the rise of racial awareness this summer, the team decided to move on from that name. But as former NFL player Jim Warren, a Lakota tribal member who's now a native activist, wants us all to understand, no longer using nicknames that indigenous people find offensive and dropping the use of their likeness as mascots is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding the plight of Native Americans today. I never did play for a team with a native mascot, but I played against teams with native mascots. So obviously I was a target of people that wanted to say things like scalp the Indian or cut your hair. When we hear that term red skin, we know that it's a term of our pelts, our scalps, that were bounties that were paid to bounty hunters. This negative imagery is getting most of the press, yet there's deeper issues in Indian country. 
We learn a lot about genocide in other countries, but we don't learn about the genocide that happened here. Back in 1890, the 7th Cavalry really wanted to get us back for Custer's Last Stand. When you look at the Wounded Knee grave site, my family is number 18 on that list of families that perished that day. Being an American citizen, many of us don't have that experience of visiting a mass grave, of feeling that trauma from many generations ago. Pine Ridge, my home reservation, is the poorest county in the United States. So the average family income is under $10,000 per year. Unfortunately, Indian country has the highest rate of COVID-19 in the world. And when I go home and I hear the people that are passing away just because they can't keep themselves warm, that's something that's very challenging. When you think of Paha Sapa, which means Black Hills, that's our sacred land. U.S. policy saw that our culture, our ceremonies were savage and heathen. So we could have been singing a song for happy birthday or a wedding and they saw it as war drums. Black Elk said it would take seven generations to heal our circle after Wounded Knee. So as we gather on this special holiday, let's give thanks for inclusion. Let's give thanks for culture. Let's give thanks for who we are as two-leggeds. Indeed, let's give thanks for how far we've come while also being thankful for the wisdom to recognize there's much more ground we need to cover. As Warren told us, simply dropping mascot nicknames and thinking the problem is solved is akin to no longer doing blackface and believing that solves racism. I appreciate you showing the uh, video and we had the honor of making that short film for the NFL social justice series that Fox uh, NFL Sports was uh, showcasing. And we're very honored to have three Emmy nominations, sports Emmy nominations. So hopefully June 8th, we're able to win one or more of those uh, nominations. And it would be wonderful to have uh, the uh, piece recognized by the Emmys. Um, uh, my name is Jim Warren. I'm Oglala Lakota. As you see, I own uh, Warrior Society Development, LLC. And I'm also part-time, I got pulled back into academia. I had thought I retired from San Diego State University back in uh, 2015, but University of South Dakota back in my homelands where my home reservation is, offered me an opportunity to uh, write some grants and do some contract work and create some programs serving tribal members with disabilities in South Dakota. So I was very fortunate to get a variety of grants funded and that program started. And then of course they wanted me to come in and uh, run the program. So I'm back in academia part-time and it's actually wonderful to be back uh, teaching because I see filmmaking as part of, uh, part of the teaching method, just using a different forum, if you will, uh, through the uh, platform of film and digital and things of that nature. So uh, again, I'm with my wife, Jill Sherman Warren. She's Hoopa, as she said, and she'll uh, share some of her perspectives after I do my first part of this presentation. So unfortunately, uh, my uh, advancer uh, ran out of battery, so I'm gonna have to do it by hand. Uh, first of all, I wanna acknowledge my family. As you see here, uh, Red Cloud was at the White House with other tribal leaders from the Oglala Lakota. So this says Dakota, but they were mistaken because we were from the Lakota band um, of the um, Oglala band of the Lakota uh, tribe. So back in 1872, my grandfather Stabber and um, <clears throat> Uh, Red Cloud and other leaders went to the White House to negotiate peace with President Grant at that time. So uh, it's very wonderful to have these pictures and history of our family so that we never forget uh, where we came from and some of the important people uh, that we had. Our grandfather, we're obviously very proud of because he wasn't uh, not only part of the leadership that went to the White House, but he was representing himself as well as the family in a good way. 
So this was Grandpa Stabber, and we found his pictures at the Library of Congress. And this is his gravestone back on Pine Ridge in South Dakota. And what you notice here is he lived to be 70 years old. And that is something I'm going to readdress later in my presentation. But that's amazing that someone from that time frame was able to live so long. Um, some other uh, grandfathers, uh, Kills on Horseback here is who I'm named after. So Grandpa Kills on Horseback, I am Tushunka Okahwachakde which is kills on horseback in English. So I'm named after Grandpa Kills on Horseback. My mom is named after Grandpa Stabber, as well as my son Ryan is named after Grandpa Stabber. So this is the real leader of our family, May Stabber Featherman, Unchi, Grandma. And she here, uh, uh, you see her with the ceremonial horse uh, that's really uh, dressed up in regalia and she's holding an infant. And uh, they're celebrating a newborn with a ceremony back home uh, on the uh, what was is now Pine Ridge Reservation. Uh, unfortunately, that newborn did not make it. Uh, that's a common reality even today regarding mortality rates of our kids, as well as uh, just our mortality rates in general. Um, here's my parents who got married in 62, as I recall, in South Dakota. So that was a wonderful happy day for them, but an unfortunate reality is when they went to try to rent a home in Rapid City, in 1962, Indians were still not allowed to live in housing. So that is why I grew up in Arizona um, as a result of that systemic racism, obviously, in terms of no Indians being allowed in housing or restaurants and things of that nature. So. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to grow up in my homelands. I grew up in Tempe, Arizona, which is where I am now at my uh, parents' home visiting. Uh, this is my grandparents, uh, Louis and Eva, and that's me. So you can see I'm a big baby. I'm a big person. I used to play professional football, so I'm a, a big and tall person by definition. But this is on the res, and you see some of the Quonset huts. Some of the old abandoned military housing is what the federal government would provide for families to live in uh, back in those days. So many families lived in those Quonset huts. Uh, so you see here a map of our reservation, our nation right now is Pine Ridge. And you see Rapid City is circled up there in the corner. So Rapid City is a town close to the reservation. You'll also notice that the Black Hills are very nearby our traditional lands. But that's the border of what is now our nation for the Oglala Lakota. The Shikanju, uh, uh, the Rosebud Reservation is there uh, located to the east of us in South Dakota. So that is the reservation. The uh, circles identify Kyle, where I grew up. Uh, Oglala Village, many people may have heard that incident at Oglala was a film that Robert Redford made addressing that uh, that small village on my reservation was the murder capital of the world. So unfortunately, non-Indians would come in and kill Indian people and a major conflict resulted. And then Wounded Knee 2 occurred after that when the occupation happened again at Wounded Knee. So uh, here's where my mom grew up, uh, getting water from the river. They would have to dig a hole in the white sand so they could get clean water to drink for the day. Here is uh, some of the schools. Uh, my mom ended up going to uh, boarding school. And that was quite a, a unique change and reality for her. I'm going to address boarding schools a little bit more in my presentation as I continue. But you see here, many of the families built their camps near the school so that they could uh, be near their families, near their children. Um, here is the Indian camp. This is where my mom lived uh, because we were not allowed to live in housing yet in Rapid City, South Dakota. So Oshkosh camp was quote unquote Indian camp. And these are some of the tents and there were other structures. My mom recalls when they were able to get enough wood to build an actual structure and not have to use a tent. Uh, so Indian camp was kind of a refugee camp or a shanty town, if you will. 
um, a community of Native people living right on the outskirts of Rapid City. So they could uh, attend school. And then, of course, they were allowed to work in the back of the restaurants or the lumber yards or whatever the case may be. So this is Indian Camp, which is going to be another one of my films in the future, telling the story of uh, why this was uh, this town was needed. And my mom has actually great memories because there were so many other kids there to play with. And it was really a Teoshpae, a community of people. So uh, it was a safe place although it was a pretty much a refugee camp. So uh, here's where I like to ask questions and think to yourself, Indian country, what is it? What do you think Indian country is? Think back to your schooling, either in high school or if you attended college. Think about the uh, information that you learned about Native Americans. And if you happen to uh, want to share, please do so in the chat because we'll be addressing some of those uh, uh, statements and questions in the chat later on. So for a moment, just think about what do you know about Indian country? What did you learn in school or at home? So when you think about what you learned in school or if you have discussions at the dinner table regarding Indian people, what is it that you discuss and where is the source of that information? So here's a quiz. So we're already taking a test. So we're very academic in this pres presentation, but here is some uh, questions that we put together years ago, geez, over 20 years ago that we made this. Um, myths quiz to address some of the myths that we face out there as tribal members, as Indian people in contemporary America. So a lot is we're easily identified by physical features. I happen to have the quote unquote high cheekbones that many people associate with Native people, but that is by no means the uh, usual for everybody. I do have long hair. Um, not all tribes have long hair. Some uh, have very little hair at all, depending on the area. So here are some of the myths that we often hear uh, in American society, that uh, Native Americans are automatically alcoholics due to a recessive gene that we have as Native peoples that separates us from other human beings. We don't pay taxes, people assume. Um, you know, there's so many things uh, the casino issue is very big in terms of a myth uh, that many times I'll go to Washington, D.C. and wanting to go negotiate and discuss Native issues at a high level. And they'll start off by going, oh, well, you have casinos. You have money. Why are you here advocating for education or for water rights or land rights? So these are some of the misconceptions that many people in America have. And one of the things that I've noticed over my years of teaching is I've been uh, fortunate to teach throughout the world. And I have found that Asians and Europeans know more about Native history, Indigenous American history, than our non-Indian brothers and sisters that are American citizens. So that's a, a unique reality for us when we travel internationally, by no means do they know us very well, but they tend to know us more than other Americans do, unless you went outside of your curriculum. So here's another one, multiple choice. Uh, you can choose which one you think uh, we prefer to be identified as. So look down there the list, and are we native? American Indians? Indigenous, indigenous people of the Americas, First Americans, First Nations, what do you think? If you don't know, take a guess, because we're called all of these things. And quite honestly, when someone asks me who I am, I say Oglala Lakota. And often people will look at me thinking, what is that? Is that Hawaiian or Samoan? You know, then I have to go, oh, I'm Sioux. And then they'll automatically go, oh, you're Indian. So again, it's a unique perspective of the labels that we have in 
in society. So all of these labels fit. Native American seems to be the uh, um, appropriate choice today. But if you're writing a federal grant, you're going to be using American Indian as a language because the federal government still uses American Indian as a title. And then, of course, the second one here regarding when were we permitted to practice our spiritual ceremonies in the United States? So when I uh, teach my non-Indian students, I often let them know that when you're taking a test like this, assume the worst and you'll most likely get an A as a grade. Now, what a sad reality for me as a member of the Oglala Lakota Nation to say that in America, assume the worst for us as people in terms of uh, suicide rates, disability rates, life expectancy, poverty, you name it, assume that we are leading the uh, negative parts of those and you'll most likely be correct. So number two, it is assume the worst was the American Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978. So they actually got it wrong because the uh, tribes don't have religions. We have spirituality. So one thing that I want you to get out of this presentation is that Indian country is diverse. Often people will go, hey, do you speak Indian? And I'll go, do you speak European? Do you speak Asian? Those are non-existent languages. I speak Lakota. Jill speaks Hoopa. There's still over 200 languages today in indigenous America. So that's something where I want, I'm hoping if anything that you take away from our discussion today is the diversity of Indian country. So here you see a map of what is now the United States. And you see, Mark, there is Indian land. So obviously the majority of Indian land is west of the Mississippi. Many people often say, why is that? Well, quite simply because first contact was on the East Coast. So the majority of tribes that met with Europeans first, the majority of those tribes perished and were exterminated. So unfortunately, many of those tribes do not exist. The Six Nations in New York and the uh, Seminoles and Cherokees in the South do still have some land base and they were able to survive the initial European contact. <clears throat> Excuse me. And here's the, our Alaska Natives. There's over, oh geez, nearly 200 Alaska Native uh, tribal organizations, corporations they're called, as a result of the Alaska Lands Claim Act during the Nixon and Ford administrations. Here you see a state-by-state -state population breakdown, and uh, seven states have more than 3% tribal representation. So you see South Dakota, where my home res is, is one of those states. But you'll notice that California only has 1% or less of the population, but they do have over 100 tribal nations in California. So I'll be uh, addressing some more of that as well, as well as Jill regarding the strong representation of California tribes. It's the mass of the major urban centers with those population uh, sources that has reduced the native representation in California. But again, there are many tribal nations back in California. And here's a sign when you come into my tribal nation, what is now Pine Ridge Reservation. So you see that we use the Oglala Sioux tribe as a result of the federal determination. Many of us would prefer to just use Oglala Lakota. We renamed the county from Shannon County, Oglala Lakota County. So uh, I'm hoping that will happen in the future, but this is our reservation land, if you will. Um, you can't really see in the bottom left corner, but my mom's standing in the uh, field where she as a child in the early 40s picked mushrooms with her grandfather. And of course the buffalo, we still have a variety of buffalo herds back home. Here is a map of what was the original land base of the Lakota, Dakota and Nakota nations. Now all of us are called the Great Sioux Nation according to American, uh, well not necessarily history, but uh, the federal government. And you see the reason why we're called 
North and South Dakota is that the Europeans first encountered the Dakota tribe. If the Europeans are West, my brother brings this up a lot, is it would be North and South Lakota. But since the Europeans came from the East, they first encountered the Dakota, and therefore the, tri uh, the states are called that. But these were the original lands, if you will, prior to states' existence uh, in terms of territories. Here's Pine Ridge Reservation and Pine Ridge and Wounded Knee identified. I want you to know where Wounded Knee is on the reservation. And then Pine Ridge is our primary village where our tribal government is located. Here's the state of South Dakota with the nine different reservations. Many people heard of Standing Rock up there in North Dakota. Standing Rock, uh, um, well, it doesn't occupy, his original lands was in what is now North and South Dakota. So you see the river there that was uh, uh, still at risk due to the pipelines. And regardless of what you feel environmentally, I would imagine this group would want to have more careful attention paid to uh, the fossil fuel industry and making sure that potential spills don't influence our water tables. Here is the Hoopa tribe. And uh, this is where Jill is from. She's going to talk much more about this in depth than when she uh, takes over. But it's a beautiful area up in Northern California uh, that still has strong cultural roots as well. So she'll be sharing some of her perspectives uh, after I share my Lakota perspectives. So there's California, as you see, has a multitude of tribal nations throughout the state. And in San Diego County, we have 18 separate reservations in San Diego County alone. So Jill and I are living in San Diego now, so we have a lot of Indian country nearby. And you see the green uh, kind of a triangle of Santa Isabel Reservation with the Ipe Nation. And we just did a beautiful movie shoot up there on the top of the mountain, which is nearly 5,000 feet up. So often people don't think of San Diego as a mountainous area, but a lot of the tribes live in those areas. So Indian country, some of the difficult history that was addressed earlier, you see here is a graph of what uh, many people thought were only 5 million people in what is now the United States, the 48 contingent states, not including Canada or Mexico or South America. Others say that we were closer to 20 million in, uh, in what is now America. So again, many of the stat, uh, statistics uh, choose the lower number so that quite frankly, America doesn't have to look at the genocidal rates that happened here. So we like to call it colonialism in our school systems. So what is the uh, definition of colonialism? What must happen when you colonize another country that you're not from? Well, in many cases it's genocide or Holocaust. In America, we don't like to address that reality of how many people actually perished as a result of European contact. So in 1492, we know that someone was lost in the Caribbean and uh, supposedly discovered something. But over that time, that 400 year Indian war was a, quite a process of, uh, of genocidal policies and regulation and federal um, um, and state rewards and bounties for Indian scalps. So you know that uh, obviously as a result, uh, we were reduced to, uh, that's a misprint there, it's 250,000 in 1890. So again, no matter if you want to say 5 million or 20 million, regardless being down to a quarter million is a significant genocidal rate. So in 1492, what were we all taught? in first grade, right? Good old Columbus, and what did Columbus do? Many municipalities, many cities are canceling Columbus Day. Rapid City of all places now has Native American Day. So quite honestly, uh, Columbus never set foot in what is now America. He stumbled upon the Caribbean. So again, if you wanna say he discovered something, then more accurately, he discovered the Caribbean. I'm sure the folks in the Caribbean would uh, say uh, similar to us as, hey, we were here, we were not discovered. 
So uh, in my usual class, this is a, quite a time frame in terms of 1492 to 1890, but I'm going to move through the colonial periods and the Trail of Tears and all of these historical events that happened through the past 400 years. And here we are now in 1890 with the Wounded Knee Massacre. So many people call it battle in U.S. history. It was not a battle. It was a massacre. There is a bill, an HR bill in now to rescind the title of battle and take away the uh, medals of honor from the individuals that committed this atrocity. So on the left, you see the uh, classic mass grave from Nazi Germany. On the right, you see a classic mass grave from America. This is to be my tribe there on the right, the Oglala, as well as some of our Dakota brothers and sisters that, were, that joined us trying to escape America and get to Canada. They were caught and they were killed. And my family, I have family members buried, as I mentioned in the film, in this mass grave. So when I look at these pictures, I'm always curious which ones are actually my family members. And what an unusual experience for someone to have as an American citizen to look at a mass grave and wonder who their family members are. <coughs> Pardon me. So here's a comparative, the United States uh, on the left side of the screen and uh, Europe on the right. So no matter what, ethnic cleansing occurred. Now we don't teach that in America, unfortunately. Hopefully that will change. Many people call it cancel culture. I call it truth. And uh, here is the Medal of Honors that were awarded. And as you see in US history, D-Day had four Medals of Honor, Pearl Harbor had 15, Battle of the Bulge had 20, and Iwo Jima had 27. So again, only Battle of the Bulge and Iwo Jima could equal the amount of Medals of Honor where Iwo Jima, 10,000 people died. We're talking about 300 family members that were killed that day at Wounded Knee. And it was done under the, uh, justified under manifest destiny. You may have been taught this term, manifest destiny, and here's a famous portrait uh, that was painted showing an angel heading west with the pioneers as the animals and the natives run away. So again, this was a reality that most of you did not learn in our education system. So one of my efforts is to actually tell the truth and change our education system so that we're not dealing with issues like mascots and Disney movies like Pocahontas that are quite insulting and most uh, importantly, inaccurate. So when you look at Indian education, these were our traditional educators, our elders, the wisdom keepers. They had that knowledge and they shared it with the community, the Tiyoshpae. Now it's changing to now, this is the education system where our kids, it was legally uh, uh, permissible for churches and other schools, government schools, to go into reservations and kidnap children and take them to these schools. So imagine as a parent, you come home and your kids are gone. Um, so that's another traumatic experience for many people with American education systems. I often joke that Fort Marion Prison here was the first tribal college. And this is where uh, Colonel Pratt supervised prisoners that happened to have the Apache prisoners of war in Florida. Here he decided to start a school, or not a school, but to educate the prisoners. And then he wanted to start schools, but the US government and none of the schools in the United States accepted these Indian students except for Hampton Black College. Now, unfortunately, many of our African-American brothers and sisters had to go to similar American schools to learn how to be American. So when you see this quote, which is quite surprising from Booker T. Washington, it is an example of how he was assimilated to see indigenous people of America in this horrible context that he says we are. So again, we are a dirty, ignorant price of humanity from his perspective. 
And then as a result of school, we go back strong, decent Christian men. So again, uh, obviously he was assimilated from his African uh, tribal knowledge and he incorporated American perspectives when looking at us as indigenous people. So Carlisle Indian School was the, one of the first Indian schools ever started that was a barracks in Pennsylvania, an army barracks. So here, when you think of your uh, group pictures, when you were in first grade or second grade or in grade school, think about all those toothless smiles and kind of goofy, happy kids. Do you see one child here smiling? Is any of these kids feeling good about their educational experience right now? I see pain, I see trauma, I see people contemplating suicide. And that was the result of the, a lot of the outcome of these schools. Now the American outcome where they said was good was, hey, look what we did, we made the Indian an American. So hence American Indian. So, and there's Richard Pratt that started the schools. So it would, the mantra of these schools was to kill the Indian and save the man. So we went through 400 years of war, and now we're going through 100 years of assimilation efforts, a different kind of genocide from a cultural perspective. So when you think of your uh, boarding schools, if any of you attended boarding school, how big were the cemeteries of children at your boarding school? Because at Indian boarding schools, there were significant cemeteries as a result of children uh, committing suicide, getting sick, or uh, attempting uh, escape and uh, dying out of, uh, from exposure, or when some of the uh, priests or the teachers went too far beating the kids and they ended up dying as a result. So here's Haskell. This is our, one of our four-year schools that currently runs in Kansas. And when I was visiting there with my son, we went to the cemetery to pay respects to the kids that perished at that boarding school. So here again is the boarding school, the things that changed. My mom remembers that first day of going to boarding school and with all the kids crying and scared. And uh, fortunately she was able to get through boarding school and succeed and not be one of these young ones that ended up uh, in the cemetery. So again, people think of uh, Indian education, they don't think of all the death that occurred as a result. Here you see a sign of a border town, scenic, right outside of Pine Ridge Reservation. And uh, this is where uh, we drive by every day to, or not every day, but when we go home, and you notice it says no Indians allowed. Could that be allowable in today's America? No, it's not. They painted over the no. So you saw this, if you saw the movie, the Academy Award winning movie, Nomads, they did a scene at this site uh, that I've done many movie scenes myself. So I'm gonna quickly go through balance because I'm already behind. And uh, balance here from a human element, when you look at us as two-legged, as human beings, there are four human elements, the mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional. So here we are, we're in the mental element right now, at least I hope so, we're learning together. We're gonna to be discussing things together later in the presentation. So from a cognitive communication aspect, the mental element is one of the human elements. The spiritual element, so it's, it can be religion. Many uh, tribal members are Christians as a result of the American attempt to change us from spirituality into a religious Christian system. I happen to be Catholic, but I no longer practice Catholicism because I fully pray the Lakota way. So that's where I, it just uh, fits better for me to connect with God or Tunkashla, uh, whatever we want to call the creator, grandfather. Emotional, you see here the emojis. Many of us now can be even more emotional and sharing our emotions because we can just push a button. So this is a wonderful tool, but remember it's only a tool because true emotion is where is your heart and how do you feel? So don't uh, always just, I mean, I'll still use the emojis. It's a beautiful tool, as I said, but don't forget to uh, verbalize and show that somebody that's important to you, that you care about them, or just ask how they're doing or do something kind for somebody that may be in distress. 
And then physical, you see our dancers here. Obviously, they're getting a good workout, but this is also a connection within the wheel that, yes, this is physical activity, but it's also a connection to Mother Earth. It's also the drum is the heartbeat of Mother Earth. The songs are often spiritual in nature or celebratory for graduations or naming ceremonies or a manhood or womanhood ceremonies. There's a lot of beautiful dances and songs that are associated with this. And what are we talking about when we talk about these elements? When we have balance between these four elements, we have wellness. So what am I talking about? Medicine wheel philosophy. This is over 10,000 years old, thousands and thousands of years. So indigenous knowledge has been here for quite some time. This is medicine wheel philosophy from my training as a Lakota. So you see that's a circle all connected. It's all uh, the directions, it's the four human elements. It's our reactions into how we deal with circumstance. It's also how we see and value the world around us. It also includes the other elements of the values of who we are as human beings, as two-legged. So when you see the medicine wheel philosophy, it's much more than just those directions. It's also up or out is honor, down or uh, within is respect. And ultimately at the center of our circle is humility. So these are the seven values of the Oglala Lakota. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, wrap up here so that Jill can get started. But I wanna close off with a few quotes. We will never be known forever by the, we will be known forever by the tracks we leave. So that's one of our Dakota quotes. And that's something where I always say, leave good footprints when I do my teachings is what kind of footprints are you leaving on Mother Earth? Are they good footprints or are they damaging footprints? So again, some of these uh, quotes that I like to use from an indigenous knowledge aspect are connected to the medicine wheel. And when you look at all these elements, uh, we have an internal locus of control from a psychological model aspect. So again, when you look at uh, these various circles from various cultures, you see the, uh, the uh, Celtic cross, which has what I see as a medicine wheel. You see the Asian yin and yang. You see a variety of different Buddhist and Aztec and Mayan perspectives with circular philosophies. Many of our organizations in Indian country are circular in terms of our logos and our tribal structure. You see here uh, the yin yang with our Asian brothers and sisters and their connection to Mother Earth and the winter and summer solstice, which we have our Sundance in time with as well. You see other organizations, Olympics, utilizing circular philosophy. So all of this is indigenous knowledge. Um, whether you know it or not, from a circular philosophy, that is indigenous knowledge. And where are we at the center? There we are with our family, our community, the water and land relatives that we have, the root nation, a mother earth herself, and then of course, star knowledge. And the seven constellations of stars forms our star quilts that we make, uh, identifying the rotation of the earth and the constellations of the star knowledge. When we think of our children, they are sacred beings. So they grow in with the family, the extended family, the Teoshpae, Mother Earth obviously is giving life, and then the next generation continues. So when you think of indigenous knowledge, many things are connected to star knowledge, as you see here with some structures. Also with the medicine wheel in uh, Wyoming that was made thousands of years ago, and other uh, um, petroglyphs in Arizona match star knowledge. And actually, I think Einstein had some tribal background because his theory of relativity is circular in philosophy, and he really valued native philosophies. So again, everything's connected, and we are all responsible for the footprints that we leave. And how can we make Mother Earth a better place as a result? Hey, Young. That's how we say hello. 
and and it's interesting to say hello because um, there wasn't traditionally a word for hello actually among many tribes that was um, acknowledging you with a look was very powerful. So historically, most often you were acknowledged with just a look because um, tribes typically believe that looks are very powerful. So my presentation is more, you know, because I know that there is interest in working with tribes directly. So understanding before being understood, working successfully with your tribal council. Um, I'm hoping that what you will find today as an outcome of my presentation will that your knowledge will be empowered, that you will increase your confidence with reaching out and build a strategy to do that. Um, and understand that when you are doing presentations to tribes, you want it to be short and powerful. So these are our outcomes with my presentation. I want to give you a little bit of background of, about knowing me. I'm an enrolled Hoopa tribal member. This is me and my sister. I grew up on my reservation hunting and fishing and um, having a, a really uh, amazing childhood. My dad served on the tribal council. My brother served on the tribal council and also as the tribal chairman. So he was the leader of our tribe for many years. I served on many tribal committees and boards um, from financial to health to education. Our tribe has a number of boards and committees that, uh, that are open for tribal members to serve on. And um, there are even in some cases, tribes have environmental boards or um, advisory boards. I served on the tribal council, so I too ended up being elected to um, the tribal council. This is me and one of the state representatives. Then later I served the Pechanga Band of Lasanyu Indians as their environmental director. I also served um, as a political director um, for some legislation that they were working on within the state of California. And then I also served the Vejas Band of Kumeyaay as their um, government manager. Understanding before um, being understood, working successfully with any tribal council. Do you know them? You know, uh, um, one of the big questions that comes about is, you know, people think, oh, I want to I want to go and help. I want to I want to help them. And one of the best things that I found um, as a example of wanting to go and help them is, who are you? And one of the stories that I was told was this young man wanted to go and help this tribe. He had heard that this tribe needed help. And so he went to the reservation and he um, asked around, you know, what could he do? He had, he was, you know, he had his degrees and he was willing to do whatever he needed to do the, to help the tribes. And um, they pointed him in the direction of a tribal elder. So the elder asked him, well, who are you? And the young man said, well, I'm, you know, I'm from so-and-so. I grew up here. He's like, but who are you? And then he said, well, I have degrees from, you know, Stanford. And, you know, he listed all his educational uh, achievements. And the elder said, but who are you? And the young man just couldn't get over what he was asking. He, he said, why, well, I, I told you. And the elder told him, if you don't know who you are, how are you going to help us? And what the elder was trying to get at was, who is he as a person? And did he know who he was? And you might, they might want to know that about you. Who's on the tribal council that you're choosing to serve? Um, it always cracks me up when um, EPA or other federal agencies send a letter to the tribe and they think they're doing a good thing and they send a letter and it says, dear tribal, you know, Hausman. Well, Hausman was the last election. The election has changed. So you can get um, a list of the, you know, if you have a tribe locally, Dry Creek um, is one of the tribes in the local area of um, the Bay Area. Make sure that the list that you have is actually 
the chairman is correct because I can tell you that if you address a letter to the tribal council and it is addressed to the wrong chairman, it is probably going to go in the trash. So know who you are, who is on the tribal council and know who you're writing to. Um, who do you know? Like, do you know anyone within the community? Have you really made much of an effort to understand who these are and who these people are and what their priorities are? Every tribe is very different. Um, in California, as my husband mentioned, there are 127 federally recognized tribes. And if there's like another 30 state recognized tribes. And then there's a, a total of, I think, another 40 tribes seeking recognition. So California is very diverse. Most of the tribes are small. Um, my husband showed you the picture of the reservations in Southern California. And some of the tribes have a very limited land base. It might only be, you know, six acres. And they might only have, some tribes have only 20 tribal members. So um, yet there are other tribes that have almost 5,000. So it just depends on the tribe and where they're located. And, and if you want to help them, then you need to know who they are and you need to know who you know knows them. Do they know you? Are you going to take the time to explain who you are and why you want to help? Tribal leaders expect you to know their community. This is not a one size fits all approach. Um, there are many tribes doing some amazing things in climate change and in climate change work. But one of my concerns is that most often those tribes that are doing the most are tribes that have very small land bases and have very small memberships, which is fine. But when you're going to deal with a tribe like Hoopa or Yurok or Morongo, where they have much larger land bases and a much larger membership to deal with, um, it's going to be much more complicated. So you need to know the community. And this is easily done through research. This is one of my tribe's um, ceremonies. You need to know them and how they function. This is my tribal council. Um, Typically, it's uh, most tribes are very formal. So you have the tribal leaders there and some of their staff that's talking to them. My tribe happens to have a um, state recognized law enforcement agency. Are there rules for presentation? You know, the biggest mistake that you can make is you're going to send an email or you're going to send a letter and um, just hope that it sticks. You know, it, what you need to do is call. It's going to take some work to um, work with the tribal council. And many tribal councils, this one's in Washington, have um, requirements in order to um, be on their agenda. And even more so with uh, COVID restrictions, many tribes are very protective and most of them have gone to Zoom meetings and limit in-person contact. So you need to know how to get on their agenda some of the tribes have specific um, submission request, you know, policies and, and practices. So you might have to let them know a week in advance and have all of the information a week in advance or even longer. Respect their time. Um, all of us know that sometimes people can get a little carried away with their PowerPoint. We'll try to limit yours to five minutes. If you have anything to say that's important, um, stick to the highlights, stick to those bullet points. This is just, a, I, mean, I threw in some different uh, tribal seals to just kind of give you a flavor of the difference between the tribes. Pictures speak for themselves. Here's a picture of Mendocino Lake. This was a few years ago. This is today. And um, you obviously can see that there is some problems. <laughs> Climate change. Pictures are worth a thousand words. Blue Lake Rancheria, this is their tribal seal. 
Tribal leaders expect a prepared presenter. Most tri tribal um, councils are very much, you know, have the technology so that you can do this, the PowerPoint and have a screen. But we, I recommend making sure you practice, meaning that don't show up to the meeting and expect that um, everything will be ready. You will need to come the day before or several hours before to make sure that your presentation is uploaded and you don't have any technology issues. Don't assume if they, you think that they know their organ, your organization or even that they might even be uh, concerned about climate change. You don't know that. You need to know them to know that. Don't make it some, uh, assumptions. Be clear, be clear, be clear. I cannot say that enough. Um, I like to pick on EPA and this is a presentation and this was actually included in a tribal leader handout um, on what not to do. They don't wanna see this. Handouts are necessary. This will allow them to follow along with you so make sure you have your handout so that in your presentation, they can make notes. Oops. And remember, nodding is not an agreement. Watch your audience. Nodding is just a way of, of letting you know that they, that they hear you. And it doesn't mean that they agree with you. They're just being polite most often to let you know that they're not falling asleep yet. So watch your audience. Nodding is not an agreement. And um, I think that's for most tribes and even saying it's kind of dangerous when you get into an audience that is quiet. They may not be in a, they may be getting ready to throw you out of the room. And I can speak from experience because even though I'm a tribal member of a tribe, I can tell you that I've been kicked out of a tribal council meeting or two for other tribes. Again, be clear, be clear. Uh, don't do this. Again, I love to pick on EPA because they like to have all these PowerPoints with this, and this is only going to put people to sleep. No acronyms. You know, for a long time, I would um, sign, you know, if I was talking to someone via email, I'd put LOL. And one day, one of the people that I was writing this to said, why do you always tell me lots of luck? I don't get it. Like, I, I feel bad every time I talk to you. And I was like, uh, I was laughing out loud, not saying lots of luck. So you and I might know the, the acronym, but they don't. You know, even EPA, don't make an assumption that they know all the acronyms. So spell it out. You don't want to have... Um, you want to have none or a few technical issues. Otherwise, you're going to end up with this. Nobody wants to see a black screen. Get ready for tough questions. Um, one of the things that I like to do when I'm talking about how to work successfully with a tribal council is I like to actually do a little bit of role play. Um, I give everyone an assigned um, persona and then you have to present. And they may, you might get a question from left field. They might say, well, you're here talking about climate change. So does that mean you own an electric vehicle? You know, they might ask you that question. What are you doing to make a change? Um, and expect that that question will be asked because they don't want you coming in telling them about what to do for climate change if you're not already walking the walk. You know what I mean? And it's okay. You know, it can be overwhelming. And let's say about how much money will we save if we um change all of our tribal vehicles to electric vehicles, how much money will we save over the next 10 years? Well, you don't need to answer that question. What you can do is say, you know what? That is a great question. Let me find out and get back to you. It's okay to say you don't know, and it's okay to say that you need to do additional research and get back to them. Don't um, try to answer a question that you don't really know the answer to because it, 
again, we're talking about trust issues here. So they're going to be able to tell if you're just trying to wing it. This is, um, again, from a, a report that was done on what tribal leaders want. They want their messages to be short and succinct. Less is more. If you don't want, if you want the council to act, don't put them to sleep. And um, there have been many a times when I was on the tribal council and even when I've been a, a part of the audience of the tribal council, where literally some of the council members did go to sleep. And um, I only stayed awake because I had to, not because they weren't putting me to sleep too. I had enough coffee. So please keep your message short and succinct. The best presentations are clear, concise, and to the point. Oops, what's going on? Um, when we think of it, of Jeff Bezos, <laughs> I like this. I like the idea that he actually banned PowerPoints. <laughs> Time is money. He doesn't need to be sitting there for 20 minutes. Um, Steve Jobs, this was one of his presentation when he was talking about cars that had, um, I guess, I think Sirius radio. Um, yeah, you know, he didn't need to have a lot of words, just to the point. So that's it. Questions, let me know. I'm happy to even look at your PowerPoint. I really appreciate the insight. Um, Jill, I appreciate the comments about Tribal Council because having stood in front of Tribal Council, literally sweating and terrified and having been grilled, I get it. <laughs> and I actually, <laughs> I, I appreciate the pointers because I know I'm going to have to be standing in front of more of them in the future. Um, we have some questions. And uh, one of the first ones I wanted to ask about, so um, many Americans were exposed to Native American history through Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. That's kind of the book that um, if you care, that's what you supposedly read. So it's, it's sort of a multi-part question. Would you recommend it? Are there better alternatives for people to watch or read in order to learn? Um, and, and zeroing down, how do you learn more about California issues and mm -hmm. tribes, this history of, of California tribes? What, what are some resources? I remember uh, I chose Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee for my uh, socialism class, I believe it was, at Tempe High School here in Arizona. And my teacher was advanced enough to say, hey, Jimmy, you're going to finally learn the truth about what happened, not what we're forced to teach. So that was wonderful from a Euro American teacher to say that because I knew about Wounded Knee. I had not read the book, but just knowing that family was buried there, we were taught that from the beginning. Uh, other books out there for my tribe would be Black Elk Speaks, because mm -hmm. Black Elk is one of our famous spiritual leaders and Nyhart interviewed him. And there's a couple of different books with different approaches to his notes that he took for that book. Uh, the Wind Won't Know My Name is a Hopi Navajo issue book because Hopi uh, Reservation is right in the middle and completely surrounded by Navajo, which is actually Diné, but they were named Navajo. But uh, that was obviously a non-Indian decision to put a res within a res. So that caused the intertribal issues. Uh, but there are a variety of books out there that uh, uh, for California natives, uh, what would you suggest would be, is there any book or any kind of uh it, resource for California it's, tribes? It's really mm -hmm. hard. Uh, many of the tribes have their own books and historical perspectives. For example, Hoopa has Our Home Forever, which is a historical book about Hoopa. And then in Southern California, many of the Kumeyaay tribes um, look at Pushed Into the Rocks as another book. So it really depends upon where you're at and what um, what area you're looking at because most tribes will have their own specific um, localized historical books that talk about the local history. Um, so it, it really just depends. I, I liked um, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee as well. Um, that's a really good book. Um, 
but I think it just depends, especially for California, because they are so diverse. You know, I didn't even get into the idea of how the tribal govern governing bodies differ from each other because Northern California tribal governments work in a different way than Southern California tribal governments work. So the governmental structure is different and you have to keep that in mind as well. So again, um, because there isn't a one size fits all, you really have to do the homework to know the people that you're looking to assist. Yeah, something I, uh, that Jill's point was know who you're addressing and, uh, and the diversity of Indian country that I pointed out. If you try to go in with a homogenized Indian model, you'll be shut down immediately. And what we're helping, because I think everyone here has a good heart and wants to do good things working with tribal nations, but so many of those folks go in saying the incorrect thing. Uh, so, you know, if you go into Hoopa saying, I apologize for wounded knees, I've gone, what? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, again, uh, and I point out these hard truths and history, not to make you feel bad. Uh, you should feel bad that you weren't taught it in American curriculum. Yes, you should feel bad about that. But the fact remains that a genocide happened here. And not only my tribe went through these uh, issues, the majority of tribes in America that are still here went through it. So again, it's kind of a know who you're talking to so that you can, you know, uh, you wouldn't go to a state legislature in California and address them as a state legislature from Hawaii. You know, again, you want to, uh, like Jill on her council was a head of state and I've been in front of the Senate and testifying. So that's where you want to be prepared in that fashion and see tribal leaders like you do federal leaders, senators, heads of state, and utilize their time effectively and respectfully, then you'll get responses to, instead of, okay, let's shut this one down. They did, you know, once again, they're inappropriate. So let's get rid of them. You don't want to, you know, go in there when you, there's potentially something you could bring to the community that would really help out. So again, these are tools for you to take you have homework <laughs> so again you know you don't just check a box and now you're an Indian expert after Jill and I talked to you for a few minutes <laughs> uh, there's a lot to go into and I presented as Jill has to many other tribal uh, governments so we have to prove ourselves first to still be real Indians and then to know who are we talking to do they do we know the tribal nation that we are standing in so mm -hmm. And, and just to, mm -hmm. to bring home the point that my presentation was actually for tribal employees. The presentation that I just gave you was actually for um, for tribal employees on how to present to the own count, the people that they're working for. So that's how complex the issue can be and really knowing your audience. Obviously in California, almost every single tribe is affected by water rights issues. And many of the tribes um, are still fighting their, their water rights, um, you know, getting them quantified. So that's a huge issue you're gonna see a lot, especially as we move further into drought conditions, you're going to see more information about about that. You're also going to probably see just as a generalized point of view with climate change, because tribal communities um, are, have a very, you know, they have larger, um, you know, older populations and younger populations. So susceptibility to, to heat, intense heat, um, is also another thing that's going to be going on. And then, of course, because of the health conditions, a lot of tribes, tribal people have, you know, um, diabetes is very rampant among tribal communities. So there's a, a lot of different things and you will see things in the media. You can just start, you know, if you have the name of a local tribe, you can just start Googling things and more than likely you're gonna run, run across good information. Most tribal, uh tribes have a website with history and some of those things, which would give a lot of addition if you know some of their history. Uh, if you're talking to Gila River, knowing that the Gila River was taken by Phoenix. So uh, knowing some of those aspects where they go, okay, this person uh, almost knows who we are. Let's maybe listen a little bit more. So those, those just some more tools for your toolbox, for your Indian one-on-one -on -one toolbox. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so this is, uh, well, I'll just ask it. Were there any white allies, so to speak, um, historically white resistors of note? You can say no. <laughs> they are definitely rare. Because unfortunately, in order to become a country to colonize, you must eliminate the indigenous. Mm -hmm. That's just by definition. So we had to be killed and eliminated in order for America to be formed. Unfortunately, America doesn't like to address that. That's the frustration of being a native person in contemporary America. Now, today, do we have allies? Yes because many of our non-Indian brothers and sisters have gone beyond American curriculum and learned who we are. Uh, my mom tells a very eloquent and powerful story when she was eight years old. She's 82 years now, still teaching at South Dakota State, doing a Zoom in the other room uh, with nursing. But she remembers her exciting trip to the city from Indian camp for the first time. And that's when she first saw her No Indians Allowed sign. And so she was going, you know, toy, toy, you know, to grandpa, why don't they like us? And he eloquently said, because they don't know who we are. 75 years later, many still don't know who we are. But you're products of American curriculum. If you're going off of that, then you're going to be ignorant by design. One of my movies, by the way. But, um, but you know, if you don't go beyond American curriculum, you're not going to know who we are and you're gonna make mistakes. So that's why the homework element and know who you're working with is very important just so you don't make that initial mistake and then you can get in the door and hopefully make a difference and again, have a quality uh, outcome as a partnership. So sorry, not too many. Uh, there were a few, I know Custer's wife was very <laughs> enthralled with Indian men. So, <laughs> so I don't know if that is an ally or not, but I know Custer didn't like it. Is that in a book uh, somewhere? <laughs> and then they just made a movie, uh, Michael Gray Eyes and um, Jessica Chastain, and she walks ahead about Sitting Bull and his relationship with a Euro-American woman. So it was mostly women, I guess, more than white men that were our allies early. <laughs> So fortunately, more white men have joined and uh, are wanting to do some uh, good things with Indian country. And the whole thing at Cannonball with the, with the um, protesting of the water and the pipeline, there were so many ceremonies of healing with the military and police and other things that said, hey, we want to do right. So even with that horrible aspect, what was going on on the outside, many beautiful things did happen as a result. We just need to keep building on those to where we get to a level where well, Joe and I don't have to be frustrated every day with something said in the news or just, you know, something happening that just, oh, no, we've been marginalized once again. So, <clears throat> and, and the issues are so complex. Um, you know, when Jimmy and I first met, I, I didn't understand the mascot issue as, <laughs> as, a, as a tribal leader, um, somebody who grew up on my reservation, I didn't agree with it. And the reason I didn't agree with worrying about the mascot was because we're trying to worry about housing health care, you know, basic water, sanit sanitary water, we, you know, that tri our tribal issues were, in my mind, much more um, basic needs than to worry about something about mascots, because to me, mascots was kind of like the artistry or, you know, it's something you worry about after your basic needs are met. And when you're trying to, to get your tribal people's basic needs met, I didn't understand the mascot issue, but luckily Jimmy is such a great teacher. And I, I realized from my own experiences with testifying before Congress that the mascot issue really is a detrimental to us because I'm having to talk to political leaders and do the basic American Indian 101. No, I don't live in a teepee. That's not my tribe did not live in teepees. No, I didn't, you know, yes, these are the normal clothes I wear. I don't normally run around in buckskins. And, and the, but this was the idea that people in Congress, our congressional reps, thought I ran around in buckskins and lived in a teepee. And when you have to, when you have to, um, 
start your conversation when you're there to argue about needing water for fish, the health of the fishery, and yet you're having to say, well, no, I don't live in a teepee because we lived in these other, <laughs> it, it just, I understood that the mascot issue completely makes us these characters of, of you know, that aren't real. We're, we are not a cartoon. We are not a um, myth. We're, you know, we're doing everything we can to survive in today's world. We're the 10% that survived a 400 year genocidal effort. So I always teach, Hey, we're the strong ones, you know, you know, let's get to that level. And I feel the seventh generation prophecy is happening with many of our young ones, you know, knowing their languages and singing the songs and having that cultural connection, but also they're going out there and learning the non-Indian world through the U S academic system. So that's a wonderful thing to see where they can balance between the two worlds, still be Indian at heart, but be effective and included in the American system. So we have time for, for one or two more questions. Um, this first one, do you have any thoughts on the Modoc War in Northern California at the end of the 19th century? Um, from what perspective? I only have the question. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what, what thought says in, do I think the tribe was right or, you know. From your own perspective, from right? your own, from your own perspective. Well, I'm, I'm kind of a crazy person, you know, I, when I <laughs> found out that, uh, you know, tribes can access GSA equipment old, you know, government equipment. I was the crazy one who wanted to our tribe to get tanks. <laughs> so that we could block off the road. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I, I, I like to consider myself a sovereigntist. And I think, you know, tribes have always historically had to fight. And, and at Hoopa, we were lucky because uh, we believe, well, it's generally, genuinely or generally believed that we were trilingual. So we picked up English very quickly and we were able to kind of make a stand um, against the, the army or, you know, the military that had surrounded us. We were able to make a stand that we weren't moving because they were trying, to, they were attempting to move us from our area. And so I think, you know, sometimes you have to stand up to government forces. You have to make a stand in order to um, keep what's yours. Yeah, the Modoc and uh, along with so many other tribal nations had similar conflicts. And more recently is AIM, American Indian Movement, the Black Panthers of Indian Country, when we occupied Alcatraz because federal law says if you abandon federal installations, it goes back to tribes. Well, of course, they didn't obey their own rules. So we uh, had to occupy some places. And DQ University, a tribal college outside of Davis and Sacramento, California, as a result of occupying an abandoned military radio station. And then they said, well, we don't really care about that land. Keep it. Then that became a tribal college. So these are federal things that we're aware of as Indians, but may be new to many of you in terms of uh, as American citizens that uh, our curriculum doesn't teach this information. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. One one more question. So I've, I'm an environmental organization. I've done my homework. I know all about your respective tribes. I don't know either one of you. I don't know anybody on your reservation. How do I get to meet you? <laughs> you want to go first in California? <laughs> um, I think the best way is to just kind of show up to it. it if you're talking about environmental issues, show up to the environmental office and introduce yourself and just say you're curious. Most tribes are welcoming um, with COVID that changes a little bit because most tribes are still closed to the public and don't want people showing up at their office. But to start that conversation with an email um, and follow up, you know, tribes are do tribal staff is inundated with not just one thing. 
there is one person doing water, doing air, doing solid waste, doing um, pollution prevention. You know, you have one person doing all of these things because the staff may only be five people and your email or your, your phone call might go unresponded to, but that doesn't mean that they're not interested. Um, even if I call, when I call, I have to, I, I try to get their cell phones myself. Uh, most of mm. them know me and I just, I don't look at it as bugging them as much as I'm just trying to make it easy for them. So if it means that I have to call a few times, have to leave a few messages, I, I do it because it's, I know that they're busy and it's just easier if I continue to do that follow-up for them. Mm -hmm. uh, very rare. Are you going to have somebody who is, um, you know, super, super responsive. It just doesn't always happen. I wish I could say that it did, but they're very busy. And I, you know, reach out to them, let them know that you have an interest and you want to start working with them in any way that you can and go to them. I mean, when the time is right, show up in person, you know, uh, always seeing the person is, is best. But I, like I said, COVID cha has changed that a little bit. And even pre-COVID, usually you'll go, I sent three emails, I made three calls, I'm checking this box, they don't want to work with us. You got to show up to the res, as Jill said, and go introduce and be that human connection. And then quite honestly, they're going to go, I wonder when this person's coming back. Will be one of their first dynamic assessments of you. Then you come back the next week going, hey, how goes it? You know, but then most cases they go, man, that's a three, four hour drive in order to go to one res, it's not worth it. And then hence, you don't get any work done. So you gotta have those road warriors, you know, mm -hmm. res hopping. And that's what I do back in South Dakota with the nine reservations. Wayne and I, I hired uh, Wayne to run my program I created there, but we will say, hey, we are doing a res hopping tour and we need to be seen at events. So go to powwows, get the booth, and just showcase your program, then you start meeting those individuals that show interest, then you do that networking where those, you know, again, a, an engagement has happened, and then what's gonna be the result of that engagement, either divorce or quality marriage. So I like to think, yeah, we have a good outcome of an engagement. <laughs> well, and, and you yourself know, Sarah, like how we met. You know, I, I, I didn't, I, I listened to the presentation that EFC West had done at our talk, and it sounded great, but I didn't know Sarah from anyone. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, what tribes did they work for? And then I went and talked to the tribes that they work for. And I found out, hey, this is going to be great. So, um, yeah, we mm -hmm. went from there. So, again, it's just networking and, and establishing credibility. Cool. Looks like we're getting cut off. Well, you're, yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's, that is it for the evening, but thank you so much. And I think I'm going to hand it back to you, John, right? And you're going to do some closing. Lamia, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Don't leave yet. <laughs> oh. I think first we'll hear from Alma. So thank you, Jill and Jim. And thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Commonwealth Club and John and Michelle, Mark, Arnov, the tech team, the Michelle Meow Show, and all of you for showing up with your interest and support of our climate justice efforts. Um, if you'd like to get involved with the Climate Reality Project Bay Area chapter, we have information on our website future programs, how to join the climate justice team. We have other teams, business engagement, alliances. And um, our climate justice team meets the first Wednesday of the month. So our next meeting is going to be June 2nd. On Sunday, June 6th, we're doing a DEIJ training, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. It's focused on becoming better allies around racism, anti-Semitism, and classism. So speaking of allyship, we're going to be thinking about allyship from different sides and different perspectives. And we also are in the middle of a monthly Indigenous Voices reading and listening circle, the third Sunday of every month. So our next meeting is June 20th. And we just met last Sunday, and actually our homework was to watch Jim's movie, Seventh Generation, and we had a really robust uh, full discussion. Um, so please join us and join our site and um, reach out to me and the climate justice team. Also, friendly reminder, we have an after party, 7.30 to 8 or 7, whenever we get off of this until 8. Um, Sarah and I and others in our climate justice team, we're going to do a little hangout. We're going to do breakout groups, give people a chance to interact, talk about what it was like to listen to Jill and Jim's presentation. Um, 
And I think that information, John, is somewhere in the Zoom or in the in the YouTube live so people can join. Uh, we weren't going to put it publicly in the YouTube line, but we can if you want. Otherwise, oh. everyone should have gotten the reminder email and it includes a Zoom link in that. So well, that's all I got. Add our uh, email or websites or whatever. If there's any questions, we'll do the best we can to help you out or direct you to the person that may have the answer. And right. it's wonderful to see Mother Earth behind you because we are all tribal members of Mother Earth's tribe. <laughs> it is true. Yeah. All right. That's all I got. So, John. Well, thank you again to our special guest tonight on our Commonwealth Club of California program. And thank you to all of you for watching and listening to us online. Feel free to share this video and podcast with your friends and family. You can find more programs at commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. Stay safe. Have a good week. Bye.